Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker tonight, Reverend Takafumi Zendu Kawakami. Reverend Kawakami is the deputy head priest of the 16th century Rinzai Zen Temple, Shunkoin. So here's the monastic temple that uh, Reverend Taka Ta um, Kawakami is from. And Reverend Kawakami annually welcomes thousands of visitors and students to his temple where he teaches Zen meditation classes and retreats in English. Reverend Kawakami has given many talks about meditation at universities and institutes in the U United States and around the world and has taken part in cognitive research on meditation and mindfulness. He also co-organizes and co-hosts study abroad programs in Kyoto with very various American and other international universities. If you're ever visiting Kyoto and would like to stay at a Zen temple, I highly recommend the accommodations at Reverend Kawakami's guest house at Shukoin Temple. So now I'd like to present Reverend Kawakami. Yoroshiku onigaishimasu. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me, uh, once again, by inviting for this event. So I'm so excited. Um, well, excited, but at the same time, uh, yes, we live in the uncertainty. Um, I think that's why, you know, today a program like this one is really important. And then also, you know, um, the, you know, this Asian Art Museum of San Francisco event, but also uh, I've been talking uh, about Zen Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, um, practice uh, in several different events as well. But um, I think that, you know, this, due to the COVID, uh, so-called our norm, you know, I use quotation mark, norm is gone. Uh, so also, you know, right now, uh, some of the, you know, people who's attending today are uh, still practicing uh, self-isolation uh, due to the state of emergency was issued. Um, Kyoto's case, uh, yes, I think not today yet, but uh, right now, but um, state of emergency will be lifted uh, in few days, but still we have no vaccine, no cure. So um, even if things are lifted, uh, we are, uh, you know, living this uncertainty once again. Then today, I want to actually uh, talk about first, you know, first part, I'm going to give you some lecture about uh, lecture on Zen Buddhism and also uh, self-cultivation practice. And also, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to lead you to uh, guided meditation. I know that those who practice Zen meditation, Zen meditation normally not guided. Uh, but due to the nature of online event, uh, I'm going to do the guided meditation. Then after that, uh, we're going to do another type of meditation, which can be quite interesting one. Uh, it's called Nanso meditation, or I call this one Bada Ball meditation. Uh, I'm going to actually um, uh, uh, you know, guide this meditation as well. Then. Uh, and we're going to have a um, Q&A session. So uh, if you have any question, uh, if you go to the bottom side uh, of uh, Zoom, you can find the Q&A button. Uh, you can actually type your question uh, so, you know, uh, I can see your question. And then so, I, you know, we can answer some of your question too. So... Uh, I'm going to actually want to share some of the slide. Um, let me see. Oops. So it actually started from the ending. <laughs> I don't know why. Oops. Can everybody see the slides? 
You can see the slide. Oh, yeah, just confirming. Do you see the slide right now? Yes. Looks okay, like you okay. do. That's good. Uh, so, so today's topic is actually Zen and self cultivation. Um, and then, you know, uh, due to the uncertainty, in the today's condition, um, actually, probably you know you can you know already attended some of the um, meditation, mindfulness, uh, online workshops, and there are many of them there right now. Um, I also hosting some of them, but also I attended some of them as well. Uh, and then looking at those uh, workshop right now, but also today's. Uh, today, you know, many people think that meditation as more like a relaxation technique. Uh, but actually, meditation is not, well, it's not really focused on the relaxation or, uh, you know, way to develop your uh, concentration or something like that. So you can compete better in the world. It's not like that way. Um, actually, you know, I was, uh, you know, as you see in the title, uh, Zen and the self cultivation. Uh, in the Eastern philosophical tradition, um, meditation is actually part of a self cultivation practice. So then, especially in Zen's case, uh, it really, you know, meditation is about observation and experiment. Then I'm gonna go to the uh, next slide to show you some, you know, blue thing about uh, meditation right now. So, a few concept you can see it. Uh, Zen Buddhism. What is Zen Buddhism? You know what we focus on. So we have a concept called no self. And then uh, this is actually kind of major difference between Zen Buddhism and also contemporary mindfulness right now too. Uh, when we say no self, sometimes people think that, oh, you know, not being a selfish or something like that way, but actually uh, no self uh, means, you know, or, you know, actually I should say that, um, what is a Zen Buddhism focus on? What's actually a uh, purpose of a practice in Zen Buddhism? A uh, classic answer is uh, what I am. You know, to answer the question, you know, what am I, you know? Then I didn't say, who am I, right? I say, what am I? Uh, so that's actually the really important question uh, we work on uh, in Zen tradition. Then when we say, what am I? Uh, so it's a self. Self is a really important thing. What is a self? That's actually the, you know, big, biggest question we deal with. Well, actually, we actually try to understand self and then try to understand the true uh, or absolute truth. Uh, in Buddhism, we call this one Dharma. What is uh, Dharma here? But before you understand truth, we need to understand about, you know, self. So that's again actually main focus. But self, in this case, uh, for instance, Western philosophy and also uh, Eastern philosophy, uh, we have a different concept here. Uh, in the Western philosophy, self is independent and permanent. And uh, this idea, if somebody familiar with uh, Western philosophy, uh, came out from Greek philosophy. And the early time in the Greek philosophy, like Plato's, uh, Aristotle's, even before that, uh, mind and the body uh, separated, you know, uh, commonly known as uh, mind-body dual, uh, dualism, right? Um, but for example, because of that, then mind is completely independent from other element. But also later time, Christianity uh, adopted that idea, soul and body. And the body is impermanent, but still, the soul is permanent. So that's why in the Western philosophy, uh, self is independent and permanent. But for example, uh, in the Eastern philosophy is the idea. Um, I can go back to this slide later, but then actually this is a really interesting point. You know? So you can see the statue here uh this is the david hume um 
So I was in Scotland last year, and uh, I took this picture of him. But, uh, so David Hume, actually a unique figure in the Western philosophy, he mentioned about no self. So what is a no self here? Then uh, he was actually often asking people the question, oh sorry, question that can you observe yourself? Can you observe yourself? So just take a few moment, you know, can you observe yourself? And then maybe when you try to observe yourself, you actually observing your mental activity, like a thought or like a feelings and sensations or maybe just, you know, some of you may be looking at, you know, mirror or, you know, phone and looking at yourself, you know, your body in a way. But it's not self itself, right? So uh, that's kind of thing you can see, you know, so that's actually the David Hume's argument. And some people actually say that David Hume possibly had some influence from uh, Buddhism as well. Uh, which is kind of, you know, uh, unique things in back then. Then um, they're talking about self. Oops, sorry, some issue with a slide. So talking about self here, and then this is a kind of Buddhist approach. And self have a, you know, or so not so have actually those just five things actually I presented here, actually creating the notion of a self. And mainly I should say our body. And then uh, another thing I'm going to mention here, oops, is physical environment and, you know, social environment. So first thing in the body, physical environment, social environment. Then this body here, actually we don't own it. So that's another thing, so, you know, you can see. Then this body, so we, this, you know, there is impermanent body. This impermanent body here, uh, some of the, you know, molecular biologists mentioned that this is like a stagnated uh, water in the river. Uh, the matter of fact, actually, this is just stagnated molecules in the current of the molecules. Uh, if you think about you know, our body in a few months, in the molecular level, it's completely different. Then whatever you can touch around us physically, those things basically just stagnate the molecule in the current, you know, slowly and quickly, some of them are slowly, some of them quickly, they can you know, uh, replace, you know, every time, you know, some of them at each moment, some of them, you know, maybe a little bit uh, take a longer time, but slowly replaced. So this is just like, you know, stagnant water in a river. So we don't permanently own these things, but it's just still here, but, you know, because just in stagnant temporarily, so we can feel like, oh, these are the things, you know, we can touch, we can feel. Then this impermanent body interact with the social and also physical environment then start creating reactions. So like, you know, feelings, sensations, then you have a perception and the mental activity and the cognition, all kind of thing happen, right? Then because of those happen due to the interaction between this impermanent physical body, social and the physical environment, we start thinking, oh, self exists. And then uh, you probably heard this expression, muga, and the English translation is no uh, self is empty or emptiness. But emptiness doesn't mean void. Uh, I often see reading some book uh, about Buddhism, uh, people, you know, translated the void, but void is not the, you know, things. Void is more like just, you know, nothing here. But nothing here, uh, but, you know, that's not actually the accurate translation of a concept of no self. Actually, no self in a way is, um, so like in this case here too, you have a body, well not you have, a, so there's a body and there's a physical environment. 
interaction that's creating reaction. Then from the reaction, there's a concept of self. So this case, you know, when we say, sometimes people say no self or self is empty, means self existing in the relationship of something, you know, around us or around us in, two, in a relationship of two things or multi things. So that's the self. And then actually, I think that, you know, this is a really great moment to think about. Um, and especially the COVID things right now. Uh, right now, in a way that we actually, I think I should. So now we actually facing many things we normally avoid to discuss or face with, right? For example, death. You know, some culture we, you know, some culture actually, we kind of consider death as some taboo. You don't really want to talk about it. Uh, you don't want to actually face our own mortality. Also sickness and also aging as well, right? But, you know, two things here, mainly like, you know, death and sickness. And then if you think about uh, death and sickness, uh, in this day, well, it's not just we just don't discuss about it, but for instance, even people get sick, uh, people just go to the hospital, right? Then if people pass away, directly go to the funeral house. Then uh, also some cases, you know, some of the culture, society, or well, Japan right now kind of still in our way too, especially in the urban area, uh, we don't live with you know, elders. You know, you don't, we don't live with grandparents or anybody older, you know, in a way that they live by themselves or, you know, we send them to the retirement house, right? So in a way that aging, sickness, and death, they are cut off from our everyday life. But now, in a way that um, due to the COVID, now this, you know, we, we kind of, you know, face this, you know, this is just right in front of us. We need to actually think about our own mortalities or possible mortality, we should say. And also possibly getting sick. But also another thing here is uh, due to, you know, talking about mortality means we need to actually think about things that are impermanent, right? But normally we avoid talking about mortality. And then even you see that, um, like some of the, you know, um, uh, terrorist uh, things happen far away or even, uh, you know, close to you, uh, but kind of consider, oh, that kind of thing happened to other people. I'm sorry for them, but, you know, we don't really think about that might happen to us in every day, you know. Uh, something we always think about, we have some sort, level of some denial about our own mortalities. Um, but now we need to think about it. Then also this type of, um, situation right now uh kind of think about how much control we don't have actually we think of you know we thought about we're like you know almighty we can change the environment we can actually uh delay the human death and then once again back you know try to kind of even push away our mortality something like that but now we kind of noticing that you know all the human so-called norm here was restricted and also um in a way that uh if you think about you know uh all the nature uh some people are saying that you know on the social media saying that oh you know nature is such a strong thing uh they went back to normal i mean probably back in a human part, human is part of uh, nature and then Maybe human doing something, I mean, well, you know, destroying the environment, something like that. But human didn't really have actual power to kind of recover the nature. 
uh, it's more like a human just being just tiny, tiny part of, you know, uh, environment. Then suddenly humans stop, you know, behaving differently. Then, but nature just, you know, go back to just normal, you know, way as the way it is. But somehow we kind of, uh, I should say, overconfident about our ability. So I think that was a great lesson, lesson we learning right now. But this, you know, I was why I was talking about this type of thing right now, and then why, you know, this, you know, self cultivation and also, um, you know, this Zen practice. So Zen practice, actually, this one here is uh, observation and experiment. Then mainly observation part. Then when you talk about this observation, what you're observing here is you're observing your feeling, sensation, your reaction uh, when this physical body and the physical environment, social environment interact. Then if you can observe and keep observing the reaction, you find some sort of patterns. Patterns, right? So, like, uh, I always, you know, uh, ask this question to the people coming to my temple uh, for the meditation class. But, uh, you know, well, most of you, I assume that you're in San Francisco right now, or at least in the United States. But um, let's say, you know, if you go to, if you come to Japan and then you go to some ramen shop, then, you know, here it's okay to make a slurping noise when you eat the noodle. Then when you hear that, even like you intellectually understanding that, oh, here in Japan, it's okay to make a slurping noise. Maybe some of you react differently. You know, you probably kind of react with uh, disgust. Some of you, you know, really strong case. Uh, maybe some of you maybe uh, say, you know, it's not like a disgust, but tiny bit of dis discomfort. But for instance, if I go there, uh, to, you know, then, you know, if somebody starts slurping the noodle next to me, but probably I have a no reaction in a way. It's more like, you know, just like an air, right? But this reaction, if you think about, you know, based on our belief about slurping noise, right? Because uh, outside of Japan, slurping noise in most of the country, except, you know, like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, southern part of China, it's okay to make a slurping noise when you eat a noodle or something like that. It's not bad matter. But most of the countries, you know, or most of, in most of the culture, slurping noise is bad matter. So that's because people actually react with more negative, have a kind of negative reactions. But in this case, if I actually approach this one more like a Zen approach, what is nature of a slurping noise? If you remove your belief about slurping noise. And the kind of classic Zen saying is, uh, when you see the beautiful scenery, but if you, can re if you remove yourself from there, is the scenery still beautiful or not? So then this case here, what is the nature here? What's a you know, beautiful uh, scenery is nature with scenery just right in front of you. So maybe the truth we, you know, tr you know uh, Zen Buddhism, we often say, uh, well, not often say, but you know, our purpose of uh, practicing meditation like this, we try to see the ultimate truth. But what is actually truth looks like? Maybe truth exists uh, beyond human imagination or beyond human perceptions or human experiences, right? So then when you actually try to see that, we need to actually do, uh, first of all, we need to observe how we are reacting then also try to find belief of value re behind the reaction, like a, you know, your reaction to the slurping nodes. Then try to find what is the belief I have about this certain thing. So normally in a way that 
emotion doesn't really come out, you know, come out from what you know things happening around us directly. Actually, emotion come out or emotion emerge from um, the belief about what's happening around us. So that's why we need to actually try to find out what what this you know wh where this reaction coming from. What kind of values or belief? And then value and beliefs are concept we have. Yeah, right. Then, based on this concept, no, then we actually kind of he because of this one, our reaction to the things happening around us is changing. So, what is happening here right now? That's really we really need to observe those, right? Then, when we find out what kind of concept we have, we this is the kind of experimental part of meditation. Or oh, this is actually a really important part of uh, self cultivation too. But what if if we can remove this belief, or you know, or we have, we see the different people who have different opinions? Then let's see if I had the same belief of this person, how my reaction change? You know, so idea like this one here, we only see tiny portion of truth as a human. Then actually there's a great story in Buddhism, uh, original version you find it in the Pali Canon. Uh, so there's seven blind people. Then there's actually uh, one elephant. And then seven people, they never seen the elephant. They, they never heard about the elephant before. Then finally they encounter the elephant in the market. Then they actually try to figure out how elephant actually looks like. Then one of them just touching the tip of tail of elephant, another one just touching the leg of elephant, and then task, trunk, ear, and so on, right? Then if somebody just touching the tail of elephant, tip of elephant, tip of, uh, sorry, tip of uh, tail of elephant, um, you know, for this person, it's like a, something like, you know, brush, you know, something fluffy in that on the top, and it's in, in the kind of fluffy things there. But for instance, if you don't want just touching the leg of elephant, you think about the elephant as more like a tree trunk, something solid, right? It's completely different images. Then story, in a story, people start arguing, you know, who's right, who's wrong. But uh unfortunately um no one actually seen the elephant as way it is right kind of uh we know you know maybe some of you uh well most of us here may be not blind but if you think about you know we're kind of almost same way we only see tiny bit of truth then we from there we start developing our version of truth and in this part here, what I want to say is actually, as a human, actually, when we experience something, instantly we try to create, a, uh, try to conceptualize what you experience. Meaning is you try to replace them with word and logic. And actually, this is a gift of a human, but also sometimes it's a curse of a human being because it's because it's a gift because uh, it's a gift because. Uh, we just need to have a small portion of a small portion of truth, and then you can actually develop bigger picture. So we spend less time to deal with you know things happening around us. Uh, that's increase our survival rate as well, which is great. But at the same time, because of this you know skill, we only see the tiny portion, but we can develop this you know bigger picture. But this bigger picture here is not what we're experiencing. You know, then because of that, kind of in a way, this bigger picture here, but unfortunately, we don't notice this what we have here and what we experiencing or maybe not beyond, you know, the truth here is completely different. We don't normally notice that what we have around us and what we have here Normally, we think that that's exactly the same. And then based on that, we start making decision judgment, right? Then normally what we do is 
when we actually deal with something and we use another assumption, what makes you feel good is what is good. What makes you uncomfortable, scary is not a good thing. Then I think that uh, kind of uncertainty part really, you know, match with this idea because uncertainty, things are ambiguous. You cannot know, you don't know everything. Then because of that, make us feel uncomfortable, make us feel scared, right? So because of that, we try to keep a distance from those uncertain things. It was it's scary, right? But because you keep more distance and things get more unknown, uncertain. So that's why even get more scarier and we try to keep a distance. And then when that's happened, we actually try to capture the everything quickly and in a more simple way. Um, because, you know, having this aha moment is actually makes you feel good. But because of it, we don't really try to see everything, but just, you know, one single clear answer like things, and then we just jump into it and then creating some quick reaction. Yeah. Like, you know, earlier in the COVID, you know, uh, this toilet paper disappeared from store, you know, it happened in Japan too, or in the US too, right? Something like that. Um, because we want to have a quick comfort. So just jump into certain clear, simple information. And then that makes you more satisfied. Uh, instead of actually trying to have a more curiosity, try to investigate more. Then uh, practice of Zen in a way, sometimes people say that, oh, you know, this Zen, Zen meditation makes me comfort. Uh, but in a way that this type of thing is not really just providing comfort, but make you, first of all, understanding that first, you know, uh, well, what we have here is not exactly the same thing as truth outside. So let's be humble, have a humility. But humility here is different from insecurity. Normally humility leading us to the um, curiosity. But unfortunately, in security case, people normally just jump into the conclusion, uh, try to find a quick answer. That's happened. So, uh, so that's why practice like this one here is more making, just try to see what we are, but also same time, see how much we actually, you know, think we understand. But same time, you know, we need to understand that it's more things beyond us. And also maybe truth is not like, you know, something you can judge, oh, this is good, this is bad. It's just, you know, things happen as happen. But because our judgment, you know, based on our feeling, then we say, oh, that's a good thing, that's a bad thing. So try to keep a distance, something like that, or oh, get close to it, you know. Uh, so thinking about something like that's probably kind of important thing in like situation like this one too. But anyway, I think uh, it's time right now to lead, oh, sorry for the mic, and then leading you to some guided meditation. Once again, uh, those who practice Zen meditation, Zen meditation normally uh, silent meditation. Uh, but due to the nature of this online environment, I'm gonna do some guided meditation. So at this moment, uh, you can actually uh, find any comfortable seated position. Um, for example, if you, you, know, you don't need to really sit down on the floor. Uh, many people think that, oh, meditation, I need to sit down on the floor, do the cross leg position, something like this, but uh, you can actually just you know, use any comfortable chair, but uh, idea is try to keep your pelvis in the upright position. So normally like an office chair's case, 
uh, chair, you know, sit is kind of declining toward the back. So try to sit down the front part of the chair. But if you're on the dining chair, normally it's flat. So, you know, any place is fine. But try to keep your pelvis in that right position. And then uh, today's case actually kind of guided the meditation. So um, try to just get to kind of close your eyes. Then you can rest your hand any place feel comfortable on the uh, on your thigh or more traditional version. You put your left hand uh, just below your pel uh, belly button like this, and you put your right hand on top and touch your thumbs to each other, kind of resting your hand around your belly button like here. And then right now, just you know, start with a regular breathing. As you breathe right now, first of all, try to pay attention to the parts of your body touching on touching chairs or floor. You see how your body weight is distributed to the place, you know, the part of your body touching the chair or floor. Kind of when you do that, kind of you can find the center of your body like that. Then bringing your attention to kind of nose and the mouth at this moment. And then see how the cool air passing through your nostrils And then when you exhale, how the warm air escaping through your nose or mouth. Then just be curious about how each breathing is different from the other. You know, for instance, air coming through your nose how the sensation you feel inside of your nostril is different from the previous one. Also, now kind of pay attention to, bring your attention to your chest. See how your chest expands and contract as you breathe in and breathe out. See how your ribs are spreading out when you're inhaling. And when you breathe out, how they are contracting. Then now you can bring your attention to your lower part of your stomach. Kind of just below your belly button where you, when you do the Zen hand position, where you hand, rest your hands. Then see how your lower part of your stomach is sticking out forward when you are inhaling. And then when you breathe out, this case, you know, try to imagine that you're pushing air against your lower part of your stomach. Or in this case, more like your tailbone. Sorry, it's not stomach, but tailbone. So when you're breathing, your lower part of your stomach starts sticking out forward. But when you breathe out, you're kind of pushing air against your tailbone.
then try to connect everything here right now. So air coming through your nose and going down to your chest and stomach and stomach kind of start sticking out forward. And then when you breathe out, you're kind of gently pushing air against your lower part of your, uh, I mean, tailbone. Then in this case also try to see how other part of your body is influenced. Like, you know, when you breathe in, breathe out, how do your shoulder and back feels like? But you don't need to just focus on the breathing only. You know, in a way that so many things probably popping up your mind right now, or your body is experiencing so many things around you. Then just, you know, don't try to push them out, but be curious about how those thoughts and the things happening around you or inside of you influencing your experience of breathing. How the thought just pop up your mind, changing the sensation you experiencing inside of your nose when you inhale. One of the things you ate before you attended the session, how the food or influencing your like chest or something like that when you are breathing out. Or maybe some of you experiencing some little bit of discomfort on your back because of your seated position, but how this discomfort changing your experience of each breathing. This is a concept called Wu Wei in Taoism. And in Taoism actually have a stronger influence in Zen Buddhism, but this Wu Wei meaning is normally translated as effortless action, like breathing, for example. But bring full attention to this effortless action to see how each time you breathe, and how all the things around you changing this, you know, sensation coming from the breathing. Then knowing what you are, how you are. That's actually a really important thing about meditation. So once again, try to Inhale through your nose and try to feel the cool air passing through your nostrils. And then when you breathe out, just more like, you know, all the body is kind of contracting and the air just coming through your nose or mouth, just warm air escaping from there. They're going to ring a bell right now so you can, uh, when you hear the bell, you can slowly open your eyes. All right. How was it? So now I'm going to lead you to non-so meditation. This is second type of meditation. And uh, like I say in the beginning, this is a kind of combination of body scanning and self-compassion. So right now, um, many of us 
kind of facing coping with some difficulties or once again the uncertainty um i think that this self-compassion is a really key to increase your resilience but resilience in this case i want to avoid a word like uh, you know we're gonna defeat or are we gonna uh win this challenge or something like that um kind of in a way that resilience in this case really helpful to resilience in this case i sh i should say means more like you know uh trying to see the situation more as the way it is instead of focusing on particular part of you know truth um emotion really or even words really change our attention um in a way that when we say you know defeat or win you kind of see situation more um kind of part that you want to fix it right but in a way that that case actually we tend to miss an apart is still functioning um so that's why word and the concept really or emotion is really important to actually pay attention to it because each emotion tool then navigate our attention to certain thing you know then right now this you know uh practice it's called hakuin's uh, non so meditation um I think I believe that uh San Francisco I mean uh, Asian Art Museum they have uh some Hakuin's work uh maybe Mike can share this some of the slide you have um so Hakuin was the master in the 18th century in Japan uh he actually yeah so that's a Hakuin's painting uh, in San Francisco, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, it's kind of, he used a cartoonish painting to kind of revive the you know, Rinzai tradition culture in, or Rinzai Zen tradition in Japan. Uh, he's a normally considered reformer of Zen. Then, um, so this case, you know, uh, why reason why he's practicing this type of, you know, studied practicing with uh, teaching this practice with a, um many of the priests back then actually don't practice meditation for relaxation actually way to find truth right so it's like you know a scientist in lab you know running experience and changing their hypothesis something like that so they get actually really stressed and also some of them even get mentally ill by practicing meditation so that's why um in a way that um so this case here he was actually telling the practitioner take care of yourself so we're gonna actually have this one here so let's you know put this you know kind of uh just imagine that you have a kind of round softball size butter on the top of your head and then let's you know in, in picture that you have this bottle butter on the top of your head then you can close your eyes then it's butter and then you can also imagine some like herb smells there like a lavenders and thyme sage something like that then as you breathe out this butter starts melting and dripping down your body and soaking into your body it stop as you breathe in and then when you actually breathe in out once again this melted warm butter kind of dripping down your body and it's soaking to your body inside your body and it stop when you inhale and then you bring it, you know, uh, and then when you breathe out, it's gonna start dripping down slowly and stop. All right. Then 
when you actually keep repeating this, you start noticing you feel like you're covered with kind of warm blanket from the top of your head. Then also you actually kind of paying attention to the part of your body that like a back of your ear or something like that. You kind of slowly kind of bring your attention to different part of your body. So then you actually sometimes people notice that, oh, I have some sort of pain in this part of my body or some discomfort, or tension. People notice that. But with this kind of warm feeling, warmness, you actually normally you associate with, you know, um, kindness or love, right? So you kind of, you notice about some tension and then kind of see, oh, this tension, maybe like it thinks, you know, uh, I always, you know, I've been worried a lot in these days. So maybe I have a tension on my shoulder and back and then maybe, uh, you know, but I don't really want to face that normally. So just try to get rid of them. But now you have a, this kind of warm sensation that wrapping them around then kind of that case actually now you can actually face with this you know discomfort or pain as well then this type of practice really, really important part is you're not ignoring pain or sadness or anger those emotions you have but now you actually kind of you know warm this warm sensation you, they can wrap them around so you can actually face them more uh, easily. You know, when the pain itself, suddenly itself, anger itself, too scared to, too scary to actually face with. But this type of practice, now you actually have a kind of wrap around them or space around them so you can actually easily to face them. So that's actually the practice like this one. But anyway, um, so I need to cut this practice a little bit short. Uh, we need to move on to Q and A time. Uh, do you have it? So I can see that. Uh, so some of you have a question. I can see some of you already posted some question at the Q and A. But you have a question. If you go to the bottom part of your Zoom screen, uh, you can find the Q and A next to chat. Uh, Reverend uh, Taka, I wanted to say that uh, for we know that the session was supposed to end at eight o'clock, but we'd like mm -hmm. to spend it fifteen minutes in order to answer questions. If you are okay with that on your time, I, I'm totally okay. I'm sorry, I just overtimed it, so oh, I just noticed that. We, we yeah. Have, so we're we're very happy. So folks can can um, enter. And Maya can pose questions to you. Okay. Oh, so. Sorry, somebody asked, what are the two panel panels behind me, behind you mean? That Fernando, this, I, I think this was earlier, so I'm not sure. If, if Fernando, if you can um, uh, let us know which panels you mean, um, we'll, we'll try to answer that. Um, the next question is, do one at a time, just, just. Okay, answer. I've just unmuted Fernando if you want to answer. Um, Fernando, hello? I, okay, I'll, I'll go to the second question um, first then. Uh, what is the calligraphy on the two panels behind you? The behind you right now. The panels? Yeah. Uh, this one here, uh, actually, uh, Talking about the Kanzan and Jitoku, uh, Kanzan and Jitoku, two kind of characters you see in a Zen story. And then actually two characters, um, slightly mentally challenged, but uh, he's all, they always have a good, good smiles. And you have also, to move over. Hmm? you have to move over so we can see the, the characters, the two Kanzan and Jitoku. Okay. Uh, They're behind you. <laughs> yeah, behind me. Yeah, this side. Yeah. So this is a Kanzan Jitoku. Uh, both of them, you know, always have a nice smile, no matter what's happened. But also, they don't care about the, what they wear, what they do. Um, so the message of this story is just be authentic. So that's the idea. 
uh, but you know, they're not having just fake smile. I mean, they actually, some of them, you know, painting, they show like crying, one, one of them crying or something like that, but you know, showing the, you know, human nature as the way it is. It's not just about, you know, we, we actually, because of a social status, something like that, we kind of always, you know, try to hide our weakness or emotion, but, you know, comes on this digital painting, just, you know, sometimes be authentic. I mean, I think this is a really important thing, especially right now. Uh, sometimes, you know, due to this difficulty, sometimes people try to avoid dealing with our own weakness or emotion. Um, normally we are kind of harsh on ourselves. you know, in a way that instead of, for instance, when you try to help your beloved one, we just willing to move quickly. And the first part is normally just, you know, hey, how are you doing, right? Are you okay? I know I feel pain. I, I feel your pain as well, something like that. We approach like that. But our case, we just ignore what we're experiencing, what we are feeling. We just try to <laughs> instantly solve the issues, okay. you know. Thank you. Uh, so that's kind of okay. idea here, yeah. And Kanzan and Jitoku is a Japanese names for the Chinese characters mm -hmm. uh, or Chinese um, eccentric uh, monks named Han, Han Shan and Shide. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is, would you please speak to your uh, use of mantras in meditation and possibly recommend mantras? Uh, well, in Zen tradition, actually, we don't use mantra. Um, the possible part is more like, uh, well, some of the Zen tradition we use uh, susoku kan, which is a counting number technique. Just, you know, count number one to 10 as you breathe. But really important thing is like I mentioned about Mui um, or Wu Wei. Yeah, right. So it's kind of, you know, counting number, but it's not just focusing on counting number, I try to ignore everything else, but how, you are surrounding you know, your con this condition here right now, influencing the count of number, you know, uh, differently in you know, each time. So that's actually a part of a uh, practice. So we don't really use mantra in a Zen tradition. But sometimes you chant the Heart Sutra at the end of a meditation session. Uh, we do the um, but sutra reading in this case is more about you know. Uh, well, actually, yeah, the sound itself, but it's, I don't consider that that's on the meditation. It's more about reconfirming the teaching of Buddha. So that's the idea. Uh, there's a question. How does Zen practice and thought conceptualize the observing ego? So, no. <laughs> um, and, and sorry. So how does Zen practice and thought conceptualize the observing ego? And is it related to the observing self? <laughs> well, I think that the ego, ego, you know, in a common sense, in a way, you know, coming from the self, and then, uh, you know, kind of idea that self is a sense, you know, ego means, you know, self exists, and then I'm the one understanding everything, something, or like, oh, I have a control over everything, you know, our body, I have a, my own control, my mind, I have a own, you know, I can control my mind, something like that way, but um yeah buddhism case the idea is well self is interdependent so depending on what's happening around you but also what this you know impermanent body condition is uh depending on that you know so the reaction different and then from those reactions we actually thinking about hey you know i'm like this i'm like that then uh, and then we think that based on the feeling sensation, we are actually behaving, we can make a decision judgment, but is there such kind of thing as this free, free will or not? That's actually the kind of question we have often. And then in the Eastern philosophy, it's maybe not. So that's why no self, no ego. I think that's, uh, so understanding about nature of self is actually the way to understand what is the ego here. I think that's the idea. Okay, we have, a, we have a lot of questions. Um, another question is, why is posture and position so important in Zazen? 
Well, the, if you well, you don't actually, for instance, there are four different positions you can practice meditation. One is seated position like this. Second is actually standing up. And the third one is uh, laying down, fourth on the walking. But um, so why the seated position like this, seated meditation, was it considered as an important, most important one in a Zen tradition is actually, so seated position give you the stability of physical stability. So you don't actually have a much, um, in, you know, like an internal stimuli, but also you can sit up straight like this. So in order to keep it straight like this, keep, keep, keep yourself in a upright position, you need to have a lot of alertness as well. Then, Due, due to the nature of the meditation, in this case, more like observation. So you need to have a good amount of alertness. So that's why posture and is a really important part of practice. So you want to have a physical stillness, yet you want to have an alertness. So that's the idea. Great. Um, this is more of a comment than it says, the one with large characters on his side is a poem about a Buddhist temple from the Tang Dynasty. So thank you for that, Xiao Xie. Um, hope I did. Uh, I said your name correctly. Um, the next question is: Please say more about becoming mentally ill after meditation. You followed up with saying to take care of yourself after meditation. So, like I say, you know, back then it's meditation, not relaxation technique. I mean, people are actually really serious about try to see the truth. Then. Uh, meditation was one way to con still consider it as you know way to see the truth, but you know always kind of as a human nature, we think we capture the you know thing happening as the way it is. But the moment we experience something, we are conceptualizing thing. Then having concept here, it's not the you know uh, ideal thing for the Zen. Then people are actually struggling to get rid of this one, <laughs> and then. You know, like I use a metaphor, like a modern day scientist in a lab, you know, they run the experiment, changing the hypothesis, and uh, people are that serious about trying to see the truth as the way it is. So that's why, you know, people get actually stressed and they even mentally get mentally ill because they thought about I'm in, uh, it is impossible to see the truth or I'm not capable, you know, capable enough, I mean, not doing enough or something like that. So. That's what's the idea. Great. Um, so the next question is, what if you feel sleepy during meditation? Sleep more. <laughs> you don't sleep enough. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sleep enough, that's why. <laughs> or depending on what you eat before the meditation, if you're eating lots of starch before the meditation, you normally get sleepy too. Just careful about the starch and sugar consumption, but also during the you need to sleep longer. So. <laughs> Maybe drink some matcha, some green tea. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a question. Honor is an uh, honor is a very important concept in many cultures, especially the notion that one honors one. Sorry, that one's honor is violated. What is the Zen Buddhist view of honor and its violation? Well, I think honor in this case, you know, how you define the honor. I mean, uh, we respect, you know individual as a way to all living creature uh, respecting, uh, you know, well, that's mean, you know, respecting every living creature. That's what, if it's honor in that case, yes. But honor as more like an ego, then that case, you know, uh, like what we already talked about, you know, uh, sometimes human think we're immortal, that we can do everything, you know, and then sometimes people, for instance, people practicing meditation or you know, Zen Buddhism more and more, and people start developing more ego. And then people feel like, you know, I you know, I should be honored as a more like a Zen masters or you know, great Zen teacher, something like that. Um, but if you is thinking about respect, yeah, you know, uh, just you know everything around us is actually basically part of us. Like I say, self is interdependent. So uh, violate, violating that, that's also means that you're violating your, the things you think you as, uh, as a self. So uh, that's actually the Buddhist uh, answer for that one. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so we have a question. If you only observe without intent, intervention about what, I'm sorry, 
if you only observe without in intervention, but what about if something bad is happening? A bad situation, like you see someone is getting hurt. You don't do anything. What is the Zen philosophy for this? Well, in this case, it's not only in Zen philosophy, but, you know, hurting. Um, but this case is actually, I feel like, I think this is a, a matter of compassion. You know, first of all, if somebody's hurting, actually, you actually approach, uh, approach them, you know, see what they, what, I mean, first of all, you know, physical hurting is somebody, but, you know, like in the violence, we actually, yeah, you know, every life is an important thing. We try to, you know, uh, save their life, but also hurting like emotionally or something like that. We actually, first, you know, uh, compassion is very important, but compassion uh, literally basically means calm means together and passion means suffering. So you kind of, you know, approach them and then try to understand what they are experiencing, you know, then, you know, all you heard, you know, I understand you, you, I feel the pain with you. So that's a compassion. Then from there, try to, um, you know, look for the, what is the suffering in this case? You know, investigating the, what is the source of suffering here? Uh, I think that's a uh, Zen approach to, you know, people hurting. But, you know, depending on it's a physically somebody, you know, attacking them or this emotion, I think that's different things. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so there's, where can we learn more about meditation? And so, for instance, I can just share, I mean, you know, book definitely a good place to go. Um, uh, also, um, you know, there's many online courses right now. Uh, oops. So, like, uh, for instance, you know, my case, I'm actually hosting the meditation courses as well online uh, you can go to this web's uh, ptx page you can find my schedule and uh, i'm doing this one i uh, just more like um donation base but uh reason why i'm doing this one you know your donation basically support my uh basically free meditation session for doctors and medical workers uh in japan and us mainly um, so you can actually learn more about meditation from uh, my session, but also uh, most of you actually around San Francisco, I assume. Uh, San Francisco, they have a great Zen center. They actually do in uh, some of the online courses as well. Uh, for instance, next month, I'm gonna give a Dharma talk at the New York Zen Center, but they're doing also kind of week, uh, weekly meditation session, something like that. Good to have a teacher, not just a read a book. Uh, human interaction, sangha, group is really important thing as well. So, all right. Great. Any other? Um, yes, we have two more questions. Uh, okay. Let's see, what was that? Um, oh, just lock that. And the, how, how do you alleviate self-will? Well, this is hard, <laughs> you know? Even like a Zen say, oh, you know, diminish all the ego, but you know, well, ego still exists. It's being a human, right? So we can, so there's no such a thing as a, you know, you can completely vanish everything. It's not just a black and a white. It's always kind of go back and forth, you know, feel like a selfless. Then sometimes, you know, your ego here, the back and forth, that's a human being. So that's the nature of the human, I think. Um, but Accepting that is actually also an important part of practice too. Um, not just, you know, creating an idealized version of you saying that I should be this way, you know, I should go that direction only. It's not like that, you know. Uh, accepting that human just goes back and forth, you know. Zen Buddhism also have a notion of self as an interdependent, but self as an independent. So just, you know, it's not the one or the other, just a uh, we go back and forth. So that's the nature. Great. Um, here's our last question. I have been told that Zen is not about attaining or achieving or accomplishing something. Can you comment on that? 
Uh, I think that that part really emphasized by modern, like modern, modern mindfulness teachers and you know, people try to compare mindfulness and the meditate, you know, traditional Buddhist meditation. Uh, then actually there's a purpose in Buddhism. If you just look at like a story in, uh, you know, historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, something like that one too. But purpose is basically what Buddha's approach would try to see the truth. What's that? We're actually finding a way to see the truth as well. Maybe in that case, we can actually reduce our suffering. So that is the idea. So it's not like a specific purpose, oh, you know, like, oh, you know, you do the meditation, you become relaxed. You do the meditation, you be happier. It's not like that way. But um, still, that is really kind of, you know, notion created by Buddhist moder modernist or uh in these days, it's mindfulness, many mindfulness instructors who don't really study about Buddhism saying that, oh, Buddhism have no purpose, but mindfulness have a purpose. You know, make you a better person, you know, make you a better corporate, you know, executive, something like that. But difference is, you know, um, maybe the much bigger in a way because seeing the truth, I mean, but every, every religion kind of same way, you know, uh, try to understand the words of God, but unfortunately, human, the God exists. Is existent God is beyond the human imagination. So, as a human, we cannot really understand, or you cannot really have a clear interpretation of God's will, uh, like a, in a Judaism or Islam. So that's why questioning about your interpretation that's actually the important part. So, this is too. I mean, yes, there's a you know goal there, but. We need to constantly questioning our own interpretation of truth. So yes, there's actually a purpose. Okay, well, this was really wonderful and I hope everyone enjoyed um, uh, sharing this moment of meditation with Reverend Kawakami. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and thank you Reverend Kawakami for leading us in this wonderful meditation.